Good afternoon. Can I remind members of the COVID-related measures that are in place and that face coverings should be worn when moving around the Chamber and across the Holyrood campus? The first item of business today is portfolio questions, and the first portfolio is justice and veterans. If a member wishes to request a supplementary question, they should press the request to speak button or indicate so in the chat function by entering the letter R during the relevant question. I call question number one, Pam Gozo. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting local police forces to respond to the mental health-related incidents. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brent. As a first responder, Police Scotland collaborates with local health boards, with NHS 24, the ambulance service and others to support those in distress. For our part, the Scottish Government has invested £1.1 billion for NHS boards and integration authorities in response to the pandemic, including £6 million towards additional telephone and online support services. £2.1 million was provided to expand the NHS 24 Mental Health Hub to be available to the public 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And Police Scotland collaborated with NHS 24 to develop a mental health pathway allowing police call handlers to provide a streamlined journey for people experiencing poor mental health, directing callers to the Mental Health Hub. Pam Gozer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. A Chief Inspector in my region highlighted the changing nature of modern policing with mental health-related incidents posing one of the biggest challenges to the force. In some cases, it takes up to eight hours to deal with them. Violent crime is on the rise, there are fewer police officers patrolling the streets than at any time since 2009. And the Scottish Government made a real terms cut to the capital budget. Will the Cabinet Secretary express his support for a local policing act so that local police have the capacity to respond to rising crime on the streets? Cabinet Secretary. Well, in my view, the police do have the capacity to respond to crime on the streets and do that extremely well, which is evidenced by some of the lowest crime rates that we have seen in Scotland for, for many, many years. I think it is also true to say that the police in particular are very used to dealing with people who are um, in a, a distressed state. They are very much, uh, as we are trying to see across the justice system, uh, trauma-informed in their response. And I think they have done a very good job. In relation to the capital budget, I note that the Conservatives proposed no amendment to the budget, so didn't propose any additional uh, funds to police, either capital or resource. So I assume from that regard that they um, supported the, the level of expenditure, the increased level of expenditure which we provided to the police. And in relation to police numbers, again, I would point out simply that we have around 32 police officers for every 10,000 people in Scotland, whereas uh, across the border you'll find it's 23 police officers uh, for every 10,000. And that we've increased police numbers since we came to uh, control in Scottish uh, Parliament and Scottish Government, whereas the, the government which she supports has reduced police numbers by 17,000 and is now trying to roll back from that. So I think we've got a very good record and we are very supportive of the police. And of course, it's worth pointing out that decisions as to the disposition of police forces is a matter for the Chief Constable, and I would hope the member would support that. A supplementary, Audrey Nicol. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how the trauma-informed approach in the newly launched Vision for Justice will be embedded within Police Scotland, for example, if there are any plans for training in this area. Cabinet Secretary. It's a very good question. I would refer to the previous comment I made around trying to ensure the whole justice system is trauma-informed. Uh, but Police Scotland have made a pledge, as I am sure the member knows as chair of the committee, uh, under the NHS National Trauma Training Programme to support our communities, especially those identified as being vulnerable and at risk, and that they do this in their daily working practices, liaising closely with national and local partners. And on the specific issue around training, uh, they have worked, first of all, to integrate trauma-informed practices in many of their key areas of business. And they have adopted the use of NHS Education for Scotland materials. That includes specialist training to detectives, custody officers, and they have committed to providing specific training to all probationary officers as part of the initial training programme. A supplementary, Willie Rennie. Uh, two years ago, over a third of police officers reported they repeatedly went to work when they were mentally unwell. Ministers at the time said they were very satisfied with the mental health support. Following additional findings last year, the First Minister said she fully supported the efforts. But this week, the Scottish Police Federation said there had been no tangible response other than to arrange a meeting within the last few weeks. 
Does the Cabinet Secretary really think this is enough? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think at the root of the point that Willie really makes is a very serious point about the um, pre prevalence of mental health um, within uh, Police Scotland. Uh, we know, he mentioned two years ago, we know, of course, that additional pressures have been built up since then, not least through COVID, but also through the work, the kind of um, non-holiday periods that people have had to work through holidays. We know that there's been a, a lot of pressure through COP26 and so on. So those pressures will have increased, and I acknowledge that. If it's not true to say this is not something that's been discussed with the police authority, and with the chief constable, I've discussed it myself with both the police authority uh, and the chief constable, I'll be discussing these and related matters with the Federation this afternoon. So it is something we take seriously, and of course we are aware of the pressures which are on police officers. One reason why, of course, we have ensured that in Scotland, unlike other parts of the UK, they have had a pay rise this year, and also that we maintain the numbers of police officers, which of course can help to reduce the pressures on individual police officers as well. Question number two, Beatrice Wishart. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will work with Police Scotland to provide clear guidelines on legal medical cannabis prescriptions sent to patients by post via Royal Mail. Uh, guidance was issued by the National Police Chiefs Council on the rescheduling of cannabis-based products for medicinal use in November 2018, and that guidance was shared with Police Scotland. Only individuals who are in receipt of a valid prescription from a specialist clinician are able to legally possess a cannabis-based product for medicinal use. Those individuals who have a prescription for these products can show that prescription to police as evidence that they are entitled to the product. And police officers can also make inquiries with the prescriber to ensure that the product has been legally obtained. Police in Shetland rely on the hard work of the charity Dogs Against Drugs to assist them in their work to tackle illegal drugs being brought into the islands, recently seizing £25,000 worth of illicit goods. These dogs are clever, but they can't tell what is legal and what is illegal, which is what happened to one of my constituents recently when his private prescription for medical cannabis was seized as a consequence of dog detection at Royal Mail's sorting office. Patients with a diagnosis and a legal prescription for medical cannabis want to ensure that they do not have any negative outcome, such as any sort of criminal footprint. So does the Scottish Government have any plans to help police officers identify legal prescriptions by introducing a scheme to assist? And is the Cabinet Secretary aware of an existing scheme called CANCAD which could be used as another tool in the toolbox for police officers to better assess situations they may face. Cabinet Secretary. Again, a very important point raised by Beatrice Wishart. I should say at the start the Scottish Government does not support the CAMCAN um, uh, system for a number of reasons, which I am happy to um, correspond with the, the um, member on. But I think she is also right to say that people who are in receipt of these prescriptions should have clarity about what the checks are. And I'm willing, for my part, to write to Police Scotland whether they want to publicise the advice that they use, which in turn is actually uh, issued by the National Police Chiefs Council. It's a reserve matter, of course, whether they want to publish that. Uh, or also, uh, I know that some of the issues around the uh, members' constituent were to do with the use of the Royal Mail. People should have clarity on what is likely to cause them issues. Because obviously, at the point of the Royal Mail, there's no need for a prescription. But when it's picked up, say, by dogs, then that's when the prescription has to be used. So I do think there's a need for more clarity here. And for my part, I'm willing to write to Police Scotland, asking them if they're able to provide that clarity. A supplementary, Polly McNeill. Thank you. As one of the co-conveners with Rona Mackay on the medicinal use of cannabis, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if the government are opposed to any kind of scheme, then, if they're not in favour of CanCard, which was designed with the help of doctors and senior representatives of the Police Federation. Ad admittedly, that was the UK. We have had a very helpful response from Assistant Chief Constable Gary Ritchie on the whole issue. Would the Cabinet Secretary be prepared to meet with us and discuss something similar so that uh, no similar incidents that happened in Shetland happen again? Cabinet Secretary. Certainly happy to meet with members uh, and to consider that. The, I think the objections to the CAM CAM scheme do come from the medical profession, at least in part, but happy to consider that and to write out to both members with more information and after that to have a meeting to discuss it further. Question number three, Gordon MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what support is being offered to veterans across the country. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the member will be aware that the Scottish Government has given an annual update to Parliament accompanied by a published report each year since 2017 on our support for veterans in the armed forces community in Scotland. And I would thank the member for his contribution to that debate last year, and I think I am right in saying in previous years, and also say that we will provide a similar update in November this year. 
We also intend to publish a refresh of our Veteran Strategy Action Plan, detailing our commitments to the veterans and armed forces community in Scotland during the first half of this year. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Edinburgh Lord Provost Commission on a Strategy for our Ex-Forces Personnel recently published a report on their work, which recognised that whilst progress has been made, there remains a long way to go in supporting our veterans. Will the Cabinet Secretary consider the findings of the report to inform both national and local policy, and particularly in relation to housing, to support the transition from military to civilian life? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Government is currently reviewing its Veteran Strategy Action Plan with a view to publishing a refreshed version during the first half of this year. So we will work with key stakeholders to determine the extent to which our existing commitments remain valid and, of course, where there is an opportunity to add to these. Uh, we intend to consult with our local authority, Armed Forces and Veterans Champions, not least uh, Frank Ross, the Lord Provost of Edinburgh, who has been mentioned by the members. And that will include, of course, the uh, proposals put forward, I think, in uh, the document by the City of Edinburgh Council. Uh, the strategy for ex-forces personnel, uh, and we will consider those views and the findings of the report when developing a refreshed set of commitments to support veterans and the armed forces community in Scotland. And just to say, in conclusion, to commend Frank Ross for the work that he's done with veterans over a number of years. Question number four, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is regarding the imp impact on Scotland to report that the UK Government is unable to give a timescale for the rollout of second phase of the veterans' ID cards. Cabinet Secretary. We believe it is important that, should they choose to do so, veterans have the ability to easily identify themselves as such when accessing services. So I would urge the UK Government to press ahead with its plans to undertake a scoping study for provision of digital verification of veteran status and thank them for involving the Scottish Government in the recent discovery work for this project. I think that involved interaction with consultants. I would encourage the UK Government though, to continue to work collaboratively to, to, to deliver a service as soon as possible which meets the needs of veterans across the UK. David Torrance. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that we all owe a debt of gratitude to our armed forces and veterans community and that an urgent commitment must be given to allow access to the scheme for all of our veterans as soon as possible? Cabinet Secretary. Okay, I do agree with the member. Veterans are assets to our society and the Scottish Government's ambition remains to make Scotland the destination of choice for service leavers from wherever they come from and their families. And by doing that, we can offer high living standards, great job prospects and a society that respects and values their contributions. So I would repeat my encouragement to the UK Government to work collaboratively with us to deliver a veterans ID service as soon as possible and it is one which meets the needs of veterans across the UK. Question number five, Casey Clark. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government, in light of recent reports of the third successful civil damages claim for rape, whether it will review the reasons why any cases were not prosecuted in the criminal courts. Solicitor General Ruth Charteris. Thank you. Um, I am grateful to uh, Ms Clark for re uh, raising uh, this important and topical issue. I can say that in two of the three cases referred to, there were indeed criminal prosecutions prior to the civil proceedings. In those two criminal cases, the jury returned a majority verdict of not proven. In the other case, a decision was taken that there could be no prosecution as there was insufficient evidence and no reasonable prospect of securing a conviction. In 2017, this decision was fully reviewed by Senior Crown Counsel with no previous involvement. This review concluded that, looking at the evidence as a whole, the decision not to raise criminal proceedings was correct. Uh, thank you. And before I, I ask for the supplementary from the questioner, indeed any other supplementaries, I should perhaps remind members about the need to avoid going into detail about specific cases or speculating about potential outcomes of any specific cases. Otherwise, members risk breaching any relevant court orders that may be applicable. Supplementary, Casey Clark. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And the standard of proof is obviously different in civil cases. But would the Solicitor General agree with me that, as a matter of policy, there should be a review of all case papers where a civil case is successful? And could she outline what the policy is in allowing private prosecutions, given that we understand from media reports that one of the women concerned is considering that course of action? Solicitor General. 
I should perhaps begin by uh, making it clear that, of course, there is no necessary inconsistency between a decision not to prosecute or a failure to obtain a conviction in criminal proceedings and success in civil proceedings. The decision maker is different. We have a jury on one case and we have a single judge or a sheriff in others. The standard of proof is different. In criminal cases, guilt must be proved beyond a reasonable doubt, whereas in civil cases, liability is decided on balance of probabilities. Obviously, the rules of evidence and procedure are considerably more relaxed in civil cases than in criminal cases. For example, there is no requirement for corroboration in civil cases, and also the rules in relation to hearsay are much more relaxed. I can say um, that in relation uh, to uh, I was asked about uh, in relation to policy uh, where civil cases um, have been successful. Um, that in the two cases um, in which uh, proceedings had taken place, a review of the evidence led in the civil proceedings was carried out and judged that it would not have made any difference to the criminal case. And in relation uh, to the other case, which uh, has been touched on, following success in the civil proceedings, the then Lord Advocate ordered that a thorough review be carried out um, by independent uh, Crown Council following the judgment by Lord Armstrong. This, as I've indicated, this review concluded that looking at the evidence as a whole, the decision not to raise criminal proceedings was correct. And supplementary from Russell Finlay. Thank you. Um, Denise Clare appreciates the need for the Lord Advocate to recuse herself from consideration of any private prosecution due to her past uh, representation of David Goodwillie. She is also grateful for the Solicitor General's offer of a meeting. But in the spirit of transparency, will the Solicitor General commit to sharing with Denise Clare the Crown's 2017 review of the original decision not to prosecute? Solicitor General. Thank you. Can I just say at the outset that I understand that the decision not to prosecute continues to cause great upset uh, to Denise Clare and that I am genuinely sorry that Ms Clare feels that she has not been provided with the relevant information. I have been asked about disclosure um, of information. Um, I understand that uh, she previously attended a meeting with prosecutors in 2011 and also that a letter was sent to our MSP uh, in 2017 following the case review in which a meeting was offered. I have already indicated to Mr Finlay that I would be very happy to meet with Ms Clare to explain the reasons for the decision, if this would be of benefit to her. And actually, I would also be keen to hear from Ms Clare about her experience in the criminal justice system in order to assist the uh, Crown Office with an ongoing wider review into the prosecution of sexual offences. Question number six, Rachel Hamilton, who is joining us remotely. I hope. I am. To ask the Scottish Government how many police officers are stationed in the Scottish Borders Command area of the Lothian and Scottish Borders Police Division. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the information requested is not held centrally by the Scottish Government, uh, and I am sure the Member is aware, she has been a Member of the Parliament for some years now, that the recruitment and deployment of police officers and police staff is a matter for the Chief Constable, who regularly reviews the size and shape of the policing workforce in light of changing demands. Uh, local div police divisions have a core complement of officers who are always dedicated locally to community and response policing and who draw on specialist expertise and resources at a region regional and national level. Uh, and the current Scottish Government statistics show that we currently have around 32 officers per 10,000 of the population. We are just over the border from um, a, the a region of Scottish borders. Uh, they have 23 per 10,000 population in England and Wales. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Um, the SNP has cut officer numbers in the Lothian and Borders Division by 59 since Police Scotland was formed. My constituents are concerned that a reduced police presence has left the borders exposed to rural crime. Presiding officer, people living in rural areas deserve to feel safe too. And I ask that the Cabinet Secretary back Scottish Conservative plans for a local policing act to increase transparency of rural office numbers. And will he meet with me to discuss the need for an official marker within Police Scotland's crime reporting system to record rural offences and hence help tackle rural crime? Cabinet Secretary. 
First of all, I'm always happy to meet with members on issues of concern. I didn't catch the whole of the request or the agreement for the meeting, but of course happy to meet with members. Uh, in, in relation to backing anything that the Conservatives say, it really has to start from a position of agreed facts. The facts are is that the Scottish Government has not cut police numbers by 59, as is said. I have mentioned already, and I think most people both know and support the idea that the disposition of police forces is for the chief constable to decide. But I would point out the hypocrisy in attacking levels of police numbers uh, in one area, where just over the border from that area, they are substantially lower, just because they happen to be overseen by a government uh, of uh, a different member, a different uh, persuasion, does not mean to say that that is uh, something that should pass without comment. So I think there is a hypocrisy in that, as I have mentioned already. And it is also true to say that what she says is really an attack on the police service, because it is the case that the police service through the Chief Constable and the Scottish Police Authority are the ones that decide on this. And before reverting to an argument about budgets, of course, the Tories did not amend the budget. They did not seek to change the police budget in this Parliament, even though they promised for many months they would uh, give more funding. So if we can start from agreed facts, then we can perhaps discuss what we can support and not support in relation to Conservative initiatives. But I do uh, re reiterate the point. I'm more than happy to meet with the member to discuss the issues that she has a concern about. A supplementary voice of charity. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, what discussion has the Scottish Government had with the Lothians and Scottish Borders Police regarding their capacity to deal with reports of violent crime in the area? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I think uh, uh, we don't discuss directly with Lothian and Borders Police. The discussions I have will be with the Chief Constable and the Chair of the Scottish Police Authority, uh, and sometimes through other organisations like the Association of Police Superintendents, for example. Uh, so the discussions are based on the national police for the force that we have. Uh, and I do believe that the increased budget for police that we managed to agree this year goes a long way to helping them to meet the uh, demands in terms of crime. Uh, now, some levels of crime have increased. The member mentions violent crime, although homicides are down at an all-time uh, low since the 1970s when records began. Uh, so it is a, a complex uh, situation, but we do provide the resources and discuss with the police the level of resources required in order to do that most important of jobs that they have, which is to meet uh, any incidences of crime in the area. It will be done on a national basis rather than regional basis, as mentioned by the member. Question number seven, Alistair Allen. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Justice Secretary has had with the UK Government regarding the impact on Scotland of the online safety bill. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, as yet, there is no finalised online safety bill published by the UK Government. Uh, whilst there has been some engagement between officials in the Scottish Government and the UK Government, I have not yet had any discussions with the UK Government on the impact on Scotland of their proposed online safety bill. Alistair Allen. I thank the Cabinet Secretary. And while the telecommunications are, as he says, a reserved issue, uh, the Scottish Government have clearly been taking important steps wherever they can to better protect people from abuse. So can, uh, can the Government give an update regarding when the main provisions of the Defamation, Defamation and Malicious Publications Scotland Act 2021 will come into force? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the member raises an important point. The Parliament, as he says, has agreed legislation that will simplify and modernise the law on defamation. I am pleased that the Scottish Government expects to lay commencement regulations in early May 2022 that will bring into force the Defamation and Malicious Publication Scotland Act 2021 this summer. A supplementary, Jamie Green. Thank you. One of the proposals of the online uh, safety bill is David's Law, named after Sir David Amos, who a public servant who paid the ultimate price uh, against hatred. Um, I would hope, in the spirit of cooperation, the Scottish Government would look favourably upon any such proposals therein and ask, therefore, if the Government would be able to ensure that his officials would work closely with the UK officials on this element of the Bill to ensure that all public servants, irrespective of political persuasion, are afforded the same rights against online abuse and hatred as every, everyone else outside of this building. Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I can first, uh, of, of course, agree that uh, it was a deplorable and tragic act that uh, led to the killing of David Amos. And anything that can lead to a situation where that kind of appalling attack can be um, less likely in future is something you would want to support. It is difficult at this stage um, to give any agreement when the bill is not published. In fact, a number of announcements have been made by the UK Government which have changed the proposed content of the bill. Uh, 
but I will look very seriously and sympathetically um, because there are some, even from some of the things that, which I've heard uh, uh, reported newspapers, some potentially very productive elements of this bill. So we'll look very seriously at that. And of course, the officials in the Scottish Government and I myself will engage with the UK Government on these issues. And question number eight, Liz Smith. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what plans it has to introduce legislation to support veterans during this parliamentary session. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we do regularly consider the extent to which introducing legislation is appropriate or possible, and we also continue to engage with the MOD as it seeks to further embed, for example, the Armed Forces Covenant into legislation through the Armed Forces Act, which received royal assent on the 15th of December. We work closely with the MOD in advance of its introduction to ensure it's fit for purpose in Scotland, and we continue to work with the MOD as they develop the statutory guidance. However, we are satisfied that the covenant provisions in the Armed Forces Act do not fall within the legislative competence of, of this Parliament. Ms. Smith. Uh, could I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? But on the 7th of December, he will recall that he announced or he re referenced 22 bills that are planned for the Justice and Veterans portfolio. However, FOI responses are very clear that the Scottish Government really does not have any plans to go down the legislative route for veterans. Could I just ask, does that mean that the Scottish Government is now saying that it is not willing to make use of the devolved powers at its disposal to create a new top-up benefit for veteran households who are in receipt of universal credit? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I think that matter uh, or consideration of that latter matter would fall to the um, Cabinet Secretary in charge of uh, Social Security, Shona Robinson. But can I say, I have just answered the, the first part of a question, which is that we continually keep under review things which we may want to legislate on. And although it does not feature in those 22 bills which the member references, a number of other bills which we are going to have to bring forward will not feature in those 22 bills as well. And it is possible other bills may come forward as well. The, the party which you represent has mentioned two or three bills itself that we want to bring forward. So it is not an exhaustive list, and we do keep under review the extent to which introducing legislation is appropriate or possible, and we will continue to do that. And very brief supplementary uh, from Rona Mackay. Thanks, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what mental health and disability support is in place to support veterans in Scotland to live a healthy life and reach their full potential. Cabinet Secretary. Well, we are committed to ensuring that all veterans living in Scotland are able to access the best possible care and support, and that includes safe, effective and person-centred health care. We fund two veteran-specific mental health and wellbeing providers, Combat Stress and Veterans First Point. Additionally, each NHS Health Board has an Armed Forces and Veterans Champion who can offer advice and guidance to veterans. And we have bold uh, ambitions, uh, going back to the previous question, for new Scottish disability benefits, although they come under the remit of the Cabinet Secretary responsible for that area. And we have already identified several ways to provide disabled people, including veterans, with a different experience when accessing the support they are entitled to, including an approved application process, helping applicants gather supporting information from a professional to help make decisions, and abolishing functional uh, assessments. It also impinges on the previous question and answer about um, uh, cards, ID cards, allowing uh, veterans to access services more easily. In addition, as part of the benefit take-up strategy, we will continue to engage with our seldom heard groups, including veterans, in order to maximise take-up to ensure that these voices are heard and considered in our policy work going forward. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes portfolio questions on justice and veterans. I will allow a very short pause in order for front bench teams to safely uh, change seats. Thank you. Thank you. The next uh, portfolio is Finance and Economy. And again, if a member wishes to ask a, question, a supplementary question, they should press the Request to Speak button or indicate so in the chat function by entering the letter R during the relevant question. Question number one, Stephanie Callaghan. Funding of 754,000 to the Coalfields Regeneration Trust will have in community-led regeneration in former coalfield coal communities across Scotland, including in the Odinston and Baleshill constituency. Minister Tom Arthur. Our continued funding for the Coalfields Regeneration Trust is helping to create jobs, enabling more people to develop the skills and qualifications that can help them secure good work, build community capacity, and improve health and well-being. 
The Trust continues to support all former coalfield communities, including those in Lanarkshire, through, for instance, the creation of community action plans in Croy, Chapel Hall, Auchinloch, Rigside and Douglas Water and Blantyre, which act as a catalyst for change. Stephanie Callaghan. Presiding officer, in stark contrast to Mrs Thatcher's heartless devastation of Scotland's coal industry that still blights many coalfield communities today, including Lanarkshire, where I live, the recent Scottish Government budget commits at least £2 billion of the first multi-billion pound public and private investment we need to see in this Parliament to ensure a just transition that invests in people and communities. Firstly, can the Minister explain why uh, he places such emphasis on the importance of workers, communities and industries across Scotland to lead in the wider plans to transform Scotland's economy? And secondly, how will these wider economic plans improve the standard of living for all our citizens, including the residents of Uddingston and Bales Hill constituency? Minister. Uh, presiding officer, a just transition acknowledges that workers and communities have historically been on the front line of significant transitions, such as in the unplanned and deeply unjust closing of coal mines. So they must have a say in how these changes are delivered. In Scotland, we're going to plan with industry, with communities and with our highly skilled workforce to secure a truly just transition to net zero. The Scottish Government believes our efforts to deliver just transition should also reduce child and fuel poverty, because fundamentally this work is about using the transition to net zero to build a fairer, greener society for all. Uh, uh, before I call question number two, I, I hear a lot of chatting, apart from members and, and sedentary interventions. I, I didn't re receive one request for an intervention and supplementary on that question, so I, I just leave that there. Question number two, Paul McLennan. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis has been undertaken of the impact of Brexit on exports from Scotland to the European Union. Minister Ivan McKee. Uh, the new trade arrangements with the EU mean more paperwork and higher costs for Scottish importers and exporters. Due to the end of the EU transition period, 55 per cent of exporters in the manufacturing industry report higher transportation costs, 42 per cent report higher costs due to red tape, and 24 per cent report extra tariffs or taxes. In 2019, Scottish exports were growing consistently in all directions to the rest of the UK, to the EU and to the rest of the world. And now we have clear evidence that this is no longer the case due to Brexit as Scottish trade in goods with the EU fell by 24 per cent in the latest year to Q3 2021 compared to the equivalent period in 2019. Paul McLennan. Can I thank the Minister for the answer? The food and drink sector has been disproportionately affected in this regard. A recent study by Johnson Carmichael and the Food and Drink Federation in January of this year has shown many Scottish food and drink suppliers plan to decrease or stop exports to the EU. The survey quizzed business leaders at some of the UK's top food and drink uh, businesses on how they were coping with increased costs, additional administration and bureaucracy a year on from leaving the EU. The EU. Can I ask what work the Scottish Government are undertaking with the sector, the food sector, to retain and grow new markets in the EU despite the disaster of Brexit? Minister. Uh, as the practical implications and challenges of the post-Brexit trading environment become clearer, the Scottish Government continues to work closely with partners to provide advice and support to food and drink businesses to help them adapt, maintain competitiveness and take advantage of new opportunities. The Scottish Government supports companies to consolidate their market positions and rebuild their export potential through innovation, capability building and developing new market opportunities. With respect specifically to food and drink, this is delivered through our support for the £4.5 million Scotland Food and Drink Export Plan, which harnesses public and private sector resources to help the industry exploit the most significant opportunities for Scotland through a dedicated global team of in-market specialists in 10 key locations, including within EU markets. The work of the export plan and in-market specialists is aligned with food and drink sector recovery plan and with our export plan, a trading nation. And this mitigates against the challenges of Brexit and COVID. It is seen as a vital initiative as markets across the world reopen following the pandemic. A supplementary, Willie really Rennie. I agree with the Minister that creating barriers to trade following the breakup of economic partnerships is a disruptive thing to the economy and cost jobs. What I can't agree is that the SNP's plan to repeat those Brexit mistakes with yet breaking up another economic partnership, the United Kingdom. So has the Minister undertaken analysis on the impact of exports from Scotland as a result of Scottish independence? I, I think that maybe have taken us a bit wider than the question <laughs> on the business bulletin, but I'm sure the Minister would be quite happy to 
Yes, indeed. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Irene is going off uh, down, uh, down a rabbit warren here. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, the, uh, we're, we're well aware of the opportunities that will arise from Scotland being an independent nation, the opportunity to trade uh, with our European partners, the opportunity not to be uh, harnessed and, and held back by the economic vandalism of the UK government with respect to Brexit, and the opportunities that arise for Scotland's exports across the wide trading uh, opportunities as a consequence of Scotland being an independent nation, able to take our place on other independent nations in the world and to be able to deliver the performance that the uh, Scandinavian countries, other small countries in Europe have delivered because they are not held back by being tied to a Westminster government that does not have Scotland's interests at heart. And as uh, Willie Rennie well knows, analysis has been done on all of these aspects and will continue to be. And when we get to the point of the independence referendum in the very near future, which will deliver a yes vote as part of that campaign, we will, of course, provide full information as to the economic perspectives and the impact, the positive impact that independence will have for Scotland's businesses. Question number three, Julian Mackay. To ask the Scottish Government how it will apply fair work and net zero criteria to the freeport developments with the UK Government. Minister Ivan McKee. Uh, fair work and net zero are central to, to our ambition for Scotland's green ports. We will apply fair work and net zero criteria at three stages of the process. Currently, we are finalising the prospectus for applicants and will ensure this, that is clear about the Scottish Government's expectations in respect of fair work and net zero. We will scrutinise all bids for evidence of a commitment to embedding fair work practices, including payment of the real living wage and pursuing robust decarbonisation plans, and following designation, strict governance and rigorous monitoring and evaluation will ensure ongoing compliance on these key priorities and across a whole range of other aspects where we are very sure and determined that successful Greenport bids will comply to all required uh, regulation, including, as I say, uh, payment of the real living wage delivering on the net, uh, the, the net zero aspirations and uh, supporting fair work practices. Applications which do not meet these high standards will not succeed. Julie Mackay. I thank the Minister for that answer. Could the Minister confirm that if companies were not to provide the living wage or not to recognise trade unions, for example, that they would be ineligible for support? Minister. Uh, we see this as a real opportunity to move forward our conditionality agenda, um, and the member will, will know, because this uh, is part of the Butte House Agreement with the Greens, that we in, intend and are very keen on something I am very committed to, um, rolling out conditionality on fair work and real living wage um, to as many businesses as possible across Scotland in terms of the support we provide, and green ports are no exception. The um, Scottish Government is very clear that fair work and payment of the real living wage um, is a requirement for us supporting any businesses within, uh, within green port designated areas. Supplementary, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's great news the Scottish Government is now back to free ports in Scotland. The Scottish Conservatives support Aberdeen Harbour's intended joint bid with Aberdeen City and Shire Councils, Aberdeen International Airport and Peterhead Port, which could create up to 22,000 jobs. However, FOIs show that the Scottish Government has yet to have any discussions on this with either Aberdeen or Peterhead Harbours. So will the Minister join me in publicly backing a bid if this comes in? Minister. Uh, it's, it's incorrect. I had a meeting, an uh, online meeting with I think, uh, Bob, uh, uh, pardon uh, my, my, my pronunciation, Sanguinetti of, uh, of Aberdeen Harbour um, in, in the last few weeks, and we talked through the, uh, the, the situation with regard to there. But I'm surprised that the Conservatives are nailing their um, colours to the mask with regards to Aberdeen. Does that mean that they uh, don't support the other uh, nine bids that are potentially coming forward across Scotland? I think local, uh, um, local uh, uh, communities will be interested to hear that. Um, there are, uh, I think, told nine or ten expressions of interest across Scotland. I have talked to, to many of those, uh, visited many of those and will continue to do so over the coming period. But of course the process for Greenport uh, application um, is a rigorous process, taking into account all the factors that have identified and it's right and proper that, uh, the, 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 obviously the process um, is seen to be transparent and fair um, and that all bids that come forward uh, are treated uh, I, um, uh, equally uh, in, in that regard and, and that's exactly what we'll continue to do. But as I said, I'm very happy to meet with uh, other ports and harbours um, and anyone else that's interested in uh, discussing uh, this issue, the issue of green ports in Scotland, uh, in more detail. A supplementary, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Scottish Government what specific consultation they have taken with trade unions and what specific actions and agreements have been met with trade unions with regards to the specification of these free ports? Minister. I have had uh, two separate meetings with the uh, SNP Trade Union Group on this issue and continue to engage with, uh, with trade unions and are very happy to, uh, um, to, to continue to do that. We have been very clear about what the, uh, 
uh, the, the requirements are with regard to the Fair Work Agenda. As I say, something I'm very committed to taking forward right across my portfolio, and particularly in regard to green plots. And we are very keen. There will be no um, degradation in terms of workers' rights. Um, there will be no degradation in terms of environmental standards. Um, and we see this as an opportunity to move forward the Fair Work First Agenda and requirements for payment of the real living wage. Uh, and as I say, I'm, I'm very happy to, to have further conversations in that regard with, the, with anybody that's interested in, in discussing this issue further. Question number four, Sarah Boyack. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its plans for enabling local authorities to bring in a transient visitor levy. Minister Tom Arthur. Work towards the draft bill to provide local authorities with a discretionary power to apply a visitor levy, including a series of roundtable stakeholder events and formal consultation, was at an advanced stage but was necessarily paused at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our 2022-23 budget confirmed that we would recommence this work. Given the continuing impact of the pandemic on the tourism sector in Scotland, we consider it prudent to carefully review the work done to date and undertake further stakeholder engagement, as set out in the Local Government Finance Settlement Letter, letter to COSLA, before making a firm decision on the next steps. Sarah Boyack. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? But it that just observe that it doesn't actually tell me um, when the visitor levy is likely to be brought to Parliament. Um, could the Minister then tell us a bit about the legislation? Will it enable local authorities to decide whether and how they use the powers without needing approval from the Scottish Government? And will the Minister confirm that exercise of this levy will not impact on the local government settlement for any council which chooses to use them? Minister. I thank the member for the supplementary question. I do not think it would be uh, correct for me to prejudge the outcome of the negotiations and engagement we will have with stakeholders and with local government. But to answer the specific point around timescales, which I think is a fair point, um, we are obviously in a point right now where we are hopefully emerging from the acute phase of the pandemic. However, we do have local government elections on the horizon. So this is work that we will be looking to pick up. Um, in the spirit that I set out in my uh, original answer to Ms Boyack following the local government elections in the spring. Uh, and supplementary Miles Briggs. Thank you, uh, Deputy President Officer. And listening to the Minister around stakeholder engagement, I think it's incredibly important he meets with the hotel industry across the capital, which is the slowest currently to recover following the pandemic. Many in the sector are warning that the introduction of the levy will also impact on their recovery. So I hope ministers will take on board that this isn't something many in the tourism industry, which has lost many jobs during the pandemic, want to see. Minister. I, I recognise the points that the member is um, making. He will be aware from our tax framework, which we publish alongside the budget, that engagement is one of our key principles. And that will, of course, inform any deliberations we have around the visitor levy. Question number five, Michael Mara. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with Dundee City Council regarding the local government funding settlement for 2022-23. Minister Tom Arthur. Uh, ministers meet COSLA and individual local authorities on a regular basis to cover a range of issues. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Economy and the Minister for Social Security and Local Government met with the Leader and Chief Executive of Dundee City Council on 21 September ahead of the 2022-23 local government funding settlement. Following the announcement of the Scottish Budget on 9 December, both the First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Economy on separate occasions met with the COSA leadership team and council leaders to discuss the impact of the budget on the 2022-23 local government settlement. Council has asked for an additional £100 million to deal with particular pressures. We have heard them, listened and gone further by providing £120 million at stage two of the budget bill. Mike Mara. Thank the Minister for that answer. The Education Committee in the Parliament is currently holding an inquiry into the Scottish Attainment Challenge. Third sector providers outlined to committee this morning their ongoing concerns around short-term interventions due to lack of security of government funding, such as in my home city of Dundee. Can I ask the Minister if he can give assurances to those providers? Does it remain his government's policy that pupil equity funding should not be used to backfill any cuts resulting from the lack of available local authority resource? Minister. Well, I would just um, first of all draw the members' attention to the fact that we are undertaking a resource spending review, and that will be a comprehensive piece of work. 
We are also drawing the members' attention to the work that we are doing around the attainment challenge, which is expanding it from the nine authorities to all authorities, recognising that poverty is not unique to those nine authorities which have previously received funding via the attainment challenge, and we have an equitable process to achieve that in the transition over the coming years. But of course, there is an opportunity for comprehensive consideration of the points the members raise through the resource spending review. A supplementary, Douglas Lumsden. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Last week, it was reported that Dundee City Council did not apply for levelling up funds, despite it being considered a high priority area. Will the Minister join me in calling on Dundee City Council to put their politics aside and work with the UK Government so the residents of Dundee do not miss out on a vital funding stream? Minister. I will respect the fact that Dundee City Council is an autonomous body which can make decisions for itself, and I would hope that the UK Government would recognise that with levelling up, that is cutting across devolved territory, and that they show this Parliament the respect that we show our local authorities. Question number six, Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to ensure that the Fair Start Scotland programme addresses the needs of those who face the greatest barriers to unemployment, such as severe disabled people. Cabinet Secretary Kate Forbes. Well, Fair Start Scotland has been designed to support those who do face the most significant barriers into sustainable work, offering personalised one-to-one -one support tailored to individual circumstances. And in addition to this, the Fair Start Scotland service providers offer specialist support to people with disabilities, including the opportunity to access individual placement and support and support and employment, where this would be of benefit to the individuals. And we'll continue to work closely with the providers to develop continuous improvement activities to improve the delivery of support. Jeremy Balfour. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer, but can she explain to me why the Fair Start Scotland programme only resulted in 24 per cent long term employment rate? Cabinet Secretary. Well, when it comes to um, the, the data, data has been published uh, today, this morning, uh, 23rd of uh, February, that shows so far there has been over 41,000 uh, starts on the service, with over 14,000 moving into work since it was launched in April 2018. And in terms of um, the Fair Start Scotland, it's been designed to support those furthest from the labour market. The majority of people who get jobs will sustain them for at least six to 12 months, which is in line with the principles of the service. And one in three participants have been supported into work. And those, of those who started work, I could go through uh, the data of the numbers who are sustaining employment over uh, the longer term, which is ultimately the aim of the programme. The supplementary, Daniel Johnson. Deputy Presiding Officer, the critical point here is ensuring those with talent gain skills and gain employment. But at a time when we are experiencing labour shortages across the economy, uh, employers continue to report that a lack of flexibility in many of the skills programmes the Scottish Government currently offers. Does the Cabinet Secretary feel there is a, a time and an urgency to review the effectiveness of our skills programmes to ensure that we uh, adequately address those labour shortages as far as we can? In short, I think Daniel Johnson has a, a good point in ensuring that these programmes are as flexible as possible, not just to tailor them to respond to the challenges that we face as an economy right now, which are acute, but also tailored to specific geographics uh, in Scotland and also particular groups. And the, the point with Fair Start Scotland is it is seeking to help those furthest from the labour market. And quite clearly, each individual who participates in that will need a particular tailored uh, support. And that's why I said in my opening remarks that it's important that we continue to work with the programme provider to ensure that we continue to improve the activities and ultimately help people into long-term employment. Question number seven, Alex Riley. The presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to ensure that financial support to assist the rising cost of living reaches those most in need. Cabinet Secretary. Well, despite the uncertainty in our own budget position, I announced a package of measures on the 10th of February to deliver £290 million of support to 1.85 million Scottish households. And that's in addition to the measures in the Scottish budget to provide a range of support for households, including £197 million to double the Scottish child payment from April and extend it to all under 16s. The cost of living crisis is immediate. It's impacting households now. That is why we've worked closely with local government to ensure that they're able to focus on delivery immediately. Ali Shirley. The problem with that finance secretary is that everyone in this chamber are earning sixty odd thousand pound a year who does not live in a, a very expensive house will get the hundred and fifty pound. So I'm going to get the hundred and fifty pound. Uh, those in most need 
who are struggling most need to get more support. The criticism that the Finance Secretary will be aware, the Poverty Alliance have said your actions today do not just represent a failure of imagination, but also a failure to live up to the responsibility to protect people in poverty. So my question is, will you listen to what all these organisations are saying? Will you accept that MSPs on £60,000 a year get £150 to help them out when those that are having to choose between heating and eating is wrong? Will you listen to these organisations? Will you think again, look again, and look at how we can help those most in need that are struggling right now in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. The member raises a number of important points, and I would reiterate the point I made when I announced this, that I have listened to those organisations. The difficulty is that I could spend months thinking, planning and using my imagination, to use Alex Rowley's words, whilst families need help now. And the plan that we have announced includes targeted support through the Council Tax Reduction Scheme, which we can use because it's established here in Scotland, helping families that are struggling the most to pay council tax, which is a reflection on those families who are struggling the most. We also announced the Fuel Insecurity Fund, £10 million to help those households who are most risk of self-disconnection. And we announced the £150 eh, to households in council tax eh, bans A to D. That is on top of eh, schemes that were already announced in the budget because we could see in advance the cost of living crisis. This is over and above that. So my commitment right now is to ensure, working with local authorities, that money gets out the door as quickly as possible. That is my priority because families need the help now. And supplementary from Fiona Hislop, if it's brief, please. Uh, with other European countries implementing measures to help individuals and families with rising energy costs, such as Belgium, who've cut VAT on electricity by 15%, Spain cutting VAT on energy bills by 11%, and France restricting increases in power costs to 4%, does the Scottish Government agree that the UK Government should be implementing cost-saving measures by cutting VAT to limit energy bills to uh, increases to help individuals with rising living costs? In short, yes, I do. And families across Scotland right now are reflecting on their energy bills. That is one of the greatest pressures on household incomes just now. Energy is reserved. We have been calling on the UK Government to implement a VAT cut on energy bills. I note that both the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats have um, also um, uh, supported that call. It would have been one of the simplest means of helping consumers in the short term, but powers over VAT are currently reserved, as powers over energy is reserved. And so in the meantime, what we have done is to deploy funding as quickly as possible to help those families who are most at need. And I can squeeze in question number eight if we have succinct questions and answers. Stuart McMillan, question number eight, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with Inverclyde Council regarding what financial support is available in addition to local government settlement. Minister Tom Arthur. As I have referenced in an early answer, ministers meet COSLA and local authorities regularly covering a range of issues, including funding. The Finance Secretary and Local Government Minister met with the Leader and Chief Executive of Inverclyde Council on 25 November. While the vast majority of funding is provided as part of the local government finance settlement, it is open to individual councils to submit a detailed business case for additional funding out with the settlement, which the Scottish Government would consider carefully. Examples of funding out with the settlement include £86.4 million for employability and the £226 million city, region and growth deal. Brief supplementary, please, Mr McMillan. Thank you. I thank the Minister for that reply. The Minister will be very much aware of uh, many of the acute uh, challenges that Inverclyde has faced, many of them actually long-term acute challenges. And does the Minister therefore agree with me that despite the vast levels of fairness that the Scottish Government actually have invested in Inverclyde, including the building of over 1,400 socially oriented homes, saving our jobs in diodes, saving our jobs at Ferguson Marine, uh, and also the city deal funding, uh, many of these challenges still exist. And so, therefore, can the Minister uh, confirm if Inverclyde Council actually have supplied a business case for additional funding to actually help, to help deal with some of these acute challenges? Minister. I can confirm to Mr McMillan that, as far as I am aware, the Scottish Government has not received a business case for additional funding for the areas he has highlighted. 
Thank you, Minister. That concludes uh, portfolio questions on finance and the economy. And there will be a short pause before we move on to the next item of business to allow front bench teams, uh, should they wish to change positions safely. Thank you.